Now, I'm going to admit something that a bloke my age wouldn't normally admit in public. I know I'm old-ish, but I got proper excited about a flower that burst into life in my garden this week. Like, proper buzzing about it. And I know somebody my age should just be like watching Instagram videos of Jack Grealish getting pissed after winning the treble, and I should only admit to that kind of stuff. But I was honestly buzzing about this. It's a poppy. I think it's a poppy. Is there a picture of it? I think you might not be able to see it. Oh, you can see it. That's bad. See this here? <laughs> it is a beautiful poppy. You can come to my garden and see it if you want. Why are you all laughing? Um, now, the reason I was excited isn't because I'm thinking of like funding a future church building for GCC through like opium sales. That's not the excitement about a poppy. Um, it's because life should not grow in my garden. This thing has survived against all odds. So let me explain. Take into account my absolute inabilities as a gardener. Take into account we've got a dog that pees on absolutely everything and chases squirrels and stuff through those flower beds every single day of the week. We've got two little boys who chuck stuff all about it. We've got, this week, the high school kids decided to throw, you know those big hula hoops? Not hula hoops, you eat the massive big hula hoops. They threw three of them in our garden along with a massive parking cone. Survived that. And we've got, we had the Rise Boys round who were playing basketball that looked more like rugby. And yet, despite all of that terror and threat, this poppy, Monday morning, in a beautiful statement of defiant life, is blooming beautiful. I was kind of expecting applause at that point, but that's fine. You know. <laughs> Honestly, life should not come amid all that carnage. But there's actually now three of them. So exciting. But where we were taken in this reading from Luke's Gospel, we were transported to a place where it was even more of a hostile environment for life. In fact, the whole thing is designed for the destruction of life. You might notice that there's Jesus taken to this place with two other criminals led for execution. Anyone notice the name of the place? It's called the skull. The point was, the way it came out of the earth, this kind of little hill, it looked like a decapitated and a decayed head. You can see why the Romans went, huh, that's a cool place to kill folk, the skull. And everything is set up here for suffering, and everyone around it is sneering and scoffing as these three men are led for execution. The whole scene is set up for the prolonged suffering they're about to endure and the certain death that is definitely coming. Life should not happen here. The whole thing is designed for death. And although it's happening to three men, it says Jesus in the middle, one on his right, one on his left, Dr. Luke, who's writing this, is desperate that you would see in Jesus, a man hanging on the middle cross, you would see someone that is blooming beautiful. He wants you to see that in this setting of death, Jesus is doing something that is going to cause life to thrive. Life is going to come from this cross. Salvation is going to come at skull rock. And I want to show you this very quickly in three things this morning that Jesus doesn't do. Sometimes we focus on what he does, but this morning I want to show you three things Jesus doesn't do that brings life from his cross. All right? Here's the third thing he doesn't do. What he doesn't do, save himself. I don't know if you noticed it, but there's three groups of people who all chirping, mocking Jesus as he's hanging on a cross. You get the people, then you get the soldiers, then you get one of the other criminals. And they all shout the same scoffing, sneering thing at him. Save yourself! The people who start off, if you look in your reading, it says, he saved others, let him save himself. Now, do you hear that? See what they're admitting? See what they've witnessed? They've seen him save other people. So they've seen him save 
loads of people from sickness and suffering. And they've seen him save loads of people from demon possession. And they've seen him raise at least two people from death, bringing them back to life. He saved others. Nobody's denying that. He is able. He is powerful. He saved. And yet the reason they're scoffing and sneering is because the saviour of others is now pinned to a cross and they laugh going ha ha save yourself but that's the point he could have but he doesn't and that's where you start to see the beauty amidst all the brutality he could have saved himself but to save me he does not save himself. You look at the three guys hanging on the cross. Two of them are there because they didn't have a choice. The two other criminals are there because they have to be there. Jesus is there because he chooses to be there. He wants to be there. And by not doing anything, he is doing something amazing. By not saving himself, he's going to save others. That's what kept and joy are declaring this morning when they get baptized. Because Jesus didn't save himself, he saved me. Life comes from the cross. Now we're going to see that clearer by the second thing he doesn't do. So, what he doesn't do, save himself, but then the second thing, what he hasn't done, anything wrong. Now mind that other criminal kind of gets in and start slagging off Jesus. But the other guy goes, listen, don't you fear God? We're under the same sentence. We're here justly getting what our deeds deserve. But he looks at Jesus and he goes, this man hasn't done anything wrong. Nothing. So criminal one and criminal two are there because they're criminals. They deserve to die. But criminal one says to criminal two that criminal number three is not actually a criminal. He hasn't done anything wrong. One of Jesus' closest mates, a guy called Peter, shadowed Jesus for three years. And he writes in the Bible of Jesus after three years, he committed no sin and no deceit was found in his mouth. See, if you followed me for three minutes, you would see sin and you would detect deceit. But Jesus, never done anything wrong. Doesn't deserve to be there. And yet that again is where we see beauty amidst all this brutality. Here is Jesus hanging on a cross, about to die the most brutal death the Romans could have imagined, and he's innocent. What would you have done in that situation? If I was innocent, I am not silent and submissive. I am shouting about my innocence. Hey, you've got the wrong dude! And yet here is Jesus, silent, submissive, willing not to save himself so that he can save others. This is the point. He allows himself to be punished for what my deeds justly deserve so that he can give me the eternal life that his innocence deserves. He hasn't done anything wrong. He is innocent. But he dies for my wrong. He is in my place. That's what Joy and Kit are saying when they get baptised this morning. Because Jesus has never done anything wrong, he can die for all the things that I have done wrong. That when he's dying on the cross, he is swallowing my sentence. He is bearing my punishment. He is getting what I deserve. Life comes from the cross. So, what he hasn't done, save himself. What he hasn't done, anything wrong. Let me give you the third one. In this we see what he doesn't reject. True faith. Now we've already clocked that one of the criminals kind of gets in amongst the other people there, the soldiers and the spectators, by hurling insults at Jesus. 
But what he says is fascinating. He gets involved, he goes, if you're the Messiah, save yourself. But then he chucks in at the end, oh, and us. So in the very same sentence that he is slating Jesus, he's also asking Jesus to save him. He is bang at it, isn't he? He's brazen. In the very same breath as insulting Jesus, he's wanting to use Jesus as an insurance policy. But isn't that how loads of people in our community live? We want nothing to do with Jesus while we live, but we would quite like Jesus to save us from hell when we die. But this criminal who's insulting Jesus but still wanting this insurance policy gets what his earthly deeds deserved at Skull Rock and then he gets what his deeds deserve in eternity. Jesus doesn't accept fake faith. But there's a change in the other criminal who's getting crucified. Mind we heard him say to the other one, don't you fear God, we're getting what our deeds deserve, but this man's done nothing wrong. And after that, if you look on the sheet, he says to Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. So one hurled insults, but this other one has insight. Insight into who he is, insight into who Jesus is, and so he sees his need of Jesus. Jesus, I need you not to save yourself so you can save me. Jesus, I need the fact you've never done anything wrong to die for what I have done wrong. And so his punishable guilt gives him a true faith in Jesus' perfect innocence as his kingly saviour. Remember me. He sees the beauty of Jesus among all this brutality. He sees past a criminal and sees a king. And he sees beyond Jesus' grave to his kingdom. It's true faith. And his statement of true faith is matched by an emphatic statement of truth by Jesus. Do you see what he says? Truly I tell you today, you will be with me in paradise. Now, if you're here skeptical, we're delighted you're here. And you could, as a skeptic, say at this point, well, Jesus is about to die, the criminal's about to die. Jesus can say what he wants. Who's to know? Maybe he got paradise. Maybe he went to hell. Maybe he just goes into oblivion. But the witnesses of Jesus in the Bible would die for holding to their testimony that they saw Jesus go from the brutality of crucifixion to the victory of resurrection. They would be willing to die for the truth that Jesus went from death to life and cross to kingdom so that this criminal's true faith meant that he would go from excruciating pain to eternal paradise. And again, that's what Kit and Joy are saying as they get baptised this morning. We sung it in that hymn, trusting God whilst living with the consequence of sin. Joy and Kit may still live with the earthly consequences of their sin here, just like that criminal was crucified. But they live in the joy that they will not face the eternal consequences of their sin in the next life. That we will swap earthly pain for eternal paradise. Because life comes from Jesus' cross. And just like the flower in my garden, just like Jesus at Skull Rock, Joy and Kit, you become blooming beautiful in Grace Mount. The rest of our community is full of people who are withering as life leaks out of them. But when you find life at the cross of Jesus, you become this flourishing thing that overflows with joy and hope. And if you're here and you've never heard this before, maybe you want some of this, maybe you feel like you need this, I need to finish just by making sure you are crystal clear on three very important things. First one, some people think that 
Christianity, church, and heaven are just for good people. But think about it. If that's the case, how can this criminal get to paradise? See, being a Christian, coming to church, finding a place in paradise isn't about good things you do. It can't be. It's about trusting that even though you have done loads of things wrong, Jesus didn't do anything wrong. And he can die for you. The second thing you need to be crystal clear on is this similar point by going, people think getting to heaven must be on the basis of how much good I've done in my life. But again, think about that criminal. He's pinned to a cross moments from death. What can he do? Can he get baptised? No. So does baptism save you? No. It's not on the basis of what you have done. It's on the basis of what Jesus hasn't done. And you also need to be clear on faith. I think a lot of people in our community think that as long as you have some kind of generic, vague faith, you'll get to heaven when you die. But again, remember, only one of the two criminals with Jesus is promised paradise. Just because you grew up in a Catholic family, just because you were christened when you were a baby, just because you have some vague belief in a God, it's not enough. And I'd love you to think about this morning, do I have more than just a vague faith or do I have a true faith that sees who Jesus is, who I am, and my desperate need of the life that comes from his cross?